Welcome to Washington Policy on the Go. My name is David Bose. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center. And this is where we bring you some of our uh, best research and uh, insights over the course of every other week. During the legislative session, it's every week uh, because there's so much going on. But outside of, of the legislative session, we bring it to you every other week. And this week, we're going to talk with two of our center directors, uh, Todd Myers, he is our vice president for research. We'll talk to him about the latest on the Climate Commitment Act and some of the uh, what he calls confessions, not, not not intentional confessions, but confessions from advocates that indeed, if it does pass, the price of gasoline would go down after all. And we'll also talk to him about the claim that air quality is in jeopardy if uh, the initiative doesn't pass. We'll talk to him about that. We'll uh, be talking first with Mark Harmsworth. He is our Center for Small Business Director. We'll get to him in a moment as well. But there is, uh, I do want to remind you, our annual dinner is coming up. And one of the keynote speakers is uh, General Jack Keane. He is uh, one of the world's foremost experts on national security and foreign policy. Uh, as a, four, a retired four-star general, he has uh, advised presidents, and, and by that I do mean the plural, presidents, multiple presidents. He's in, um, advised uh, Congress, uh, both uh, representatives and in the Senate, and uh, and he has also advised uh, national security officials uh, just across the board. Um, so with the world as uh, dangerous and as volatile as it is right now, his insights will be all the more powerful. So I'd urge you to go to, go to WPCDinner.com. That's WPCDinner.com. Get your ticket to our annual dinner event, October 25th, and remind your friends and uh, and others as well, especially if you, know, if, if you know they should be involved with Washington Policy Center but are not. Make sure you send it to them and say, hey, this is your chance to start getting involved. Um, support this, this cause and keep uh, Washington friendlier toward the free market. And, uh, and as soon as you see their research and see what it is they're exposing and the analysis they're providing, you'll see that value right away. So WPCDinner.com for those tickets. Um, Mark, we'll start with you. Thanks for uh, being on, of course, as always, especially on uh, this uh, particular day for you. So um, <laughs> uh, I, I do want to bring up, you have a, a blog out and it's, it's unusual in that uh, this is a study that was put out by a left-leaning organization um, and it's about it's supposed to provide uh, um, evidence that uh, the Biden administration is doing a great job for for private businesses. And they put out a map of of the United States and on the map, everywhere that is green is uh, showing growth over the last four years and private businesses being started and growing and everywhere that is brown is not. And there's two. Well, there's three places that have a brown problem. There's the uh, Alaskan wilderness, <laughs> where where if you live in the Alaskan wilderness, there's not a lot of private business going on there. And then there's there's a couple of counties in Arkansas, it looks like, that are having some struggles. And then the entire state of Washington is brown, the only state in the union that is just totally without a place, a county that is growing in private enterprise. Um, give us your analysis of, of this report and what it's based on. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me here today, Dave. Um, the report was published by the American Center or the Center for American Progress, which, as you mentioned, is quite a left-leaning, progressive um, policy uh, think tank who who produced normally a lot of stuff that is very pro big government and anti-business. Um, so it's surprising to see this particular report. And I can't overstate, and if you get a chance, go to the Washington Policy website and look at the blog because the the picture on there it, it is shocking and brown's probably the right color but we've got some some counties ironic or not maybe it's not ironic kittitas county is one of the ones that looks like it's not uh struggling quite as much basically zero percent growth but um king county Snohomish county pierce county we're we're talking 40 50 percent loss in private business startups compared to uh, other places in the US where they're seeing over 100% growth. Um, and when you look at the map, what you'll see is, um, and it's down to the county level. So it's, it's really interesting to see how the rest of the uh, the country fares, including Idaho and Oregon and Montana, who are doing remarkably uh, much better than we are, remarkably much better than we are as a state. Um, We've been looking at this, uh, and I, I put a article out 
um, maybe about a week or two ago, um, which pulled some other data in as well that showed that we're the 46th most business unfriendly state to start a business in. And what it comes down to really is when you're starting a small and running a small business, you're looking for tax stability, rule stability. You don't want things to change too much on you because your margins are so thin when you're when you're starting out. So when the state comes in and, and starts passing um, huge amounts of regulations, just think about the ergonomics regulations they've pushed through in the last few years. Um, and you might think, well, that's great. But if you're a small business of two or three people, having to buy two or three hundred dollar desks is, is quite an impact when you're first starting up. Um, and so you get these regulations, you get the insurance requirements that put on businesses from L&I, and they're very aggressive with their enforcement on things. Um, as we came out of COVID, we saw them going and fining a lot of businesses up in Bellingham and in down in Olympia. And, oh, looks like you mentioned to share it here. Um, there we go. And so you can clearly see that Washington is... Uh, the brown state at the top left-hand corner and, and a little bit of Alaska, as Dave mentioned. But a lot of these regulations that are put on, think about the cap gains tax, how much uncertainty that is introduced for small business owners. Many small business owners um, don't have necessarily a 401k. Their business is their retirement plan. And their goal is to really build it to a point where they can either pass it or pass it on to somebody in their family or sell it for a profit and then use that money to retire on. So when you start bringing in capital gains taxes uh, at 7% on over certain amounts, then you, you start seeing this uncertainty. And even if they exempt small businesses or your primary business in the rules initially, we all know they're going to be coming back and trying to change that in the future and bring those thresholds down. And that instability is why you look at this map and you go, that makes sense, because why would I introduce that level of instability into my business planning when I can go park in Idaho, where I know things are fairly stable, and although they have an income tax, they're you know, there there are other things in there which which definitely benefit a small business to start. And so that's what's happening. It's the taxation, the regulation, an instable fiscal policy, and businesses are showing us by not coming here. Yeah, I was wondering how that compared to the you know, we were recently ranked as uh, pretty high for you know business friendly. And you you mentioned this on your blog uh, about this piece where you're doing a comparison of what they were looking at versus you know what uh what this um left-leaning you know map or, or i shouldn't say the maps left leaning but the organization that created the map and um you know why don't you, uh, you know forgive me if you're repeating it a little bit but why don't you walk us through how that compares what that's like yeah so if you look at the the factors that from a business perspective rather than a employee of the business perspective which is what they've really focused on in this study, there's different elements that you would bring into it. So for example, um, as a business owner, you're looking at regulations, you're looking at the infrastructure, the roads, and and how much it costs to drive around the region. Just think about the tolling that's coming in on all of our freeways, including I-5. Watch, out, watch that space. I've warned folks before. They're doing it. They're studying it right now. Tolls on I-5 from Everett down to Tacoma. But what they do is they also bring in a couple, I'm looking at the chart right here, which is also on the blog. They bring a couple other things in here, um, cost of living, technology and innovation, which obviously we're one of the leading states on that for sure. And, and then quality of life. And again, we have a fabulous environment that we live in here with access to skiing and, and outdoor activities. And when you factor those elements in, it, it kind of skews the number much, much higher. So we look much better. But it doesn't mean it's easy to do business here. It just means that as an employee, it's a great place to live and be an employee, but as a business owner, it's getting harder and harder and harder because they keep changing the rules on us. Um, would you say that map is is like um, is a, a portent of things to come? Like one of the things you know that that people kind of get used to whatever they're in, you know, and they, and I forget what the phenomenon is, but but uh, you know, if if good times are rolling, people people generally think, well, this is the way it's going to be forever, you know, and then. Um, you know, and and they don't get the sense. They don't look for the warning signs that things are going to change. That that things are are different. Um, 
and until it suddenly happens, then it's much harder to work your way back, right? It's it's like your health, but right. I mean, if you're if you notice, hey, there's some things I need to take care of. It's much easier, you know, to get going right away than it is to wait for a disaster to unfold. Mm -hmm. um, do you get the sense that the that the map that's being presented here is, um, you know, the a portent of things to come, where there there will be more and more of these kinds of rankings that show Washington in, in trouble? Yeah, I think so, unfortunately. Um, if they continue using the different factors in their weight, it's not going to look so bad on the national level because we'll just slowly come down as, as things happen. But as businesses move from the state, your quality of life is going to come down because you there aren't as many jobs. Um, the state is continually raising B&O taxes, which, if you didn't know, were based on gross profit, not on net. So businesses that um, can make a you know, make money each year, they may actually make a loss and they're still taxed on the money that they receive. And so these types of things, I think, will start affecting particularly the small businesses. And then if you think about somebody like a, a Boeing um, employer, now while Boeing themselves, they'll, I mean, I'm, I feel fairly confident they're going to work through their strike issues. They'll work through their quality problems. It's going to take them a while to turn this thing around. But in the interim, all of the supplier companies, all the um, ancillary companies that support the, the aerospace industry, um, those guys are going to be suffering. And those are small businesses. You know, they're the welders, they're the parts suppliers, they make the hooks from the from the back of the seats and all this type of stuff. And what happens is, is just generally, um, and you see this particularly with Microsoft, when they do layoffs, um, the employees spend a lot of money in their communities, and that money doesn't get spent. And so this is just general slowdown. And that's what we're starting to see now where small businesses are not coming here. You don't have that flexibility for those jobs. And uh, Washington is obviously suffering as a result. Question from Heidi. Have you looked at minimum pay for exempt pay? I think it's around 65 to 70,000 for exempt employees, which is quite high, plus taxes, regs, rent, insurance, utilities. Uh, first, explain what she means by minimum pay for exempt pay and then Comment. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you hire an employee, there's exempt and non-exempt employees based on salary levels. If you are below a certain threshold, which is tied to the minimum wage plus some uh, factor, fudge factors in there, um, that level as an employer, you can't have a salaried person below that level. They're an hourly employee. The net effect of this is, and that level, by the way, has gone up significantly over the last few years. It was down in the $30,000 and $40,000 range. Now we're up in the sixty dollars to $70,000 range, and it's going to keep on going higher. So if you make less than that, and you're, and you're an employee right now, um, your employer is going to flip you to an hourly rate at some point. When you're an hourly rate, you're now paying, and the rules and L and I will enforce this Department of Revenue as well. They will keep you within that 40 hour week. So instead of, hey, I'm paying you the money to get your job done, and some weeks you get to take off early, and some weeks you have to work a little extra, um, what's going to happen is the, your employer is going to limit you to 40 hours a week based on budget. Um, if you're a nonprofit, what this means is no more volunteer hours because if you're an employee, because they can't afford necessarily to pay you time and a half overtime rates for those additional hours. And the hours have to be taken within a two week period. So the pay period that you're in. So you can't just say, hey, work an extra Saturday and then take it as a, an extra day on your vacation in a month or so. You have to either pay the salary or make that time up within that two week window and l and preference is to pay the salary you start thinking about farm workers who work huge amounts of hours during the during the um, season when they're harvesting and almost nothing for the rest of the year suddenly you're paying massive amounts of overtime during the harvest and then you can't um, amortize that over the year it's made a huge effect on employers it's very subtle it's behind the scenes most folks don't realize it um, most employees may not even be picking this up but uh, it's, it's had a huge effect on uh, suppressing the number of available hours for employees to work. So, in fact, I heard some employees complaining the other day, uh, just while I was waiting in line somewhere, that 
that they were their hours were low and and they were upset by it and i thought i wonder if this <laughs> i wonder if this is a part of it but as you yeah. point out it's much harder for people to see it because you know it's not on the price tag it's 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 a behind the scenes thing that few people deal with most people are not involved with that kind of policy and it makes it uh, more difficult to expose and more difficult to explain and more difficult to get rid of so uh, yeah, difficult. that's for sure. Uh, looks like we had one more. Nope, same question. Okay, so uh, we answered that one live from Heidi. Appreciate that. Uh, Mark, um, I know we're going to be talking more about this, and you'll be sharing your insights on that at the annual dinner event coming up on October 25th. Um, we'll have a Washington Policy Center panel, as well as our special guests, General Jack Keane, retired four-star general and national security and foreign policy expert. Um, it's going to be a fantastic event. Molly Hemingway, uh, prominent uh, writer, uh, best-selling author, and uh, editor-in-chief of The Federalist. So uh, we'll see you there, and I'm going to let you go so you can uh, celebrate the day. All right, thanks, Mark.